Welcome to this next episode in our Emmis at Home series, a program developed by Emmis to share thought leadership safely and securely from their homes during a pandemic. We are pleased to welcome Supriya Menezes, who will be moderating a panel discussion on the challenges of managing rare disease studies in ophthalmology. And I'd like to wrap up with asking each panelist to share a success story about your involvement in a rare ophthalmic disease study or what inspires you to continue to participate in research around rare ophthalmic diseases. Some of my experiences, some of my um, successes, the the Coloboma protocol that we've been doing and engaging social media as a lesson, albinism, creating new outcome variables and engaging the FDA, uh, and StarGuard, again, engaging the FDA and using their each patient as his or her own control based upon carefully obtained natural history study. And, and I want to thank Dr. Clemens and all those that have been involved in the MACTEL2 project because the success of one group of people in a rare disease often can pay forward. So in this particular example, the fact that MACTEL2 showed that there was a relationship between retinal structure using an imaging modality, OCT, and retinal function. In the end, the FDA cares about function. And so the fact that that correlation exists now enables me as somebody working in StarGuard to say, you know, my primary outcome variable is going to be a structural outcome because look at that result from the MACTEL to phase two trial. So I think that that there is a synergy often created with successes in rare disease clinical trials research. In terms of why I stay with it, uh, one, I just find it very rewarding and very fun. And as Dr. Clemens pointed out, a lot of these conditions, if not nearly all of them, have no, have no treatment. There's nothing that we as ophthalmologists have to offer patients. And so the fact that you can think of potential new treatments, try those and hopefully do some good. To me, that's a, a really strong motivator. I'd like to start with uh, or discuss an example of a disease where we're still in the early stages of describing this condition and understanding it. It's in the natural history stage, and that is reticular pseudodrusin, which is a mouthful, um, but it's an interesting story. It's a condition that was described decades ago. It's very subtle drusen-like changes. Um, the Kleins here at the University of Wisconsin were one of the first to describe it, seen in fundus photographs. It really wasn't until OCT uh, and even high resolution OCT that we're able to better identify these pseudo drusen. We don't really know what they are. They're drusen, they're deposits under the retina, not under the RPE. And it really takes multimodal imaging to identify. So we do know that with an autofluorescence with OCT uh, and infrared, we will get the best chance of identifying uh, these new Drusen-like structures. And they're important because they've been shown, they correlate with some worse outcome in terms of geographic atrophy. So these are older patients. AMD is not a rare disease. We thought this feature was pretty rare, but it turns out it's not so rare. So we're getting more information on how often we even see these atypical pseudodrusen. And now there is a natural history study underway. It is taking a lot of images. It does mean a fairly long visit for the patient, but with the help of EMIS, um, we are, I think, able to get really good information on patients with drusen, with and without those pseudo drusen uh, and try to understand what what happens what is the natural history we have come up with a common language i think that took a while we've also come up with some imaging strategies so it's evolving but it is an example of what we certainly thought was rare uh turns out not to be so rare but it's been uh difficult to find so we're really working on kind of uncovering the the mystery behind the pseudo drusen. As Dr. Bloody mentioned, um, MacTel, um, I was also a part of the MacTel um, and uh, getting the uh, 
structural outcome that is was used is currently being used in the phase three study, I, I think for me was very rewarding. Um, the phase one study um, for the neuroprotectant that is currently under study um, started when we were just understanding the natural history. So we had an underlying natural history study that was ongoing. And at that time we had about six or seven years of follow-up on those patients. And what we were learning was that vision, visual acuity was slowly pro progressing in those patients. Actually, we had, had conducted an analysis and on average, those patients lost about one letter of visual acuity per year. So, um, as was noted, um, the um, outcome for the FDA was um, is usually best corrected visual acuity, um, and it's usually 15 letters is the bar. So, um, if we were to conduct a, a study, um, as you can imagine, in MACTEL using um, best corrected visual acuity, um, it would be a, a very long, daunting study. This outcome in the phase one, which was just a safety outcome, and that was okay with the FDA. We also used it um, as in phase two, again, to collect more information and um, again, stronger um, um, information with regards to the relationship of structure and function. It was able to provide that information um, to the FDA and also to the European European regulators, uh, EMA, um, um, to show that yes, indeed, even uh, what we showed from the natural history data, which was a strong correlation with structure and function, um, was even stronger with our uh, clinical trial phase two information the relationship with structure and function. Um, uh, in um, from that information, they did allow um, for our phase three study, which was the pivotal study. So for me, that was very rewarding, especially given that um, um, we really, this is, MACTEL is a disease where we have no treatment. We appreciate your time today. For our viewers, if you have any additional thoughts or questions, we encourage you to reach out to MS. You may contact me directly or others in the Ophthalmic Therapeutic and Research Unit shown here. We also hope you will join us for our other MS at Home events. Thank you for attending and have a lovely day.